Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. You know, I was appointed. I was appointed as uh, part of the like host party that I will be moderating uh, this uh, this discussion, and um, the idea is that I will be not moderating it. The goal of uh, today's uh, discussion is to talk about transportation, transportation as a quality of life indicator in big uh, metropolitan areas, and what new type of mobilities can be considered today in different cities, and just to what extent programs like healthy streets and other programs would be uh, in demand in big megapolises. And uh, are these programs supported not only by municipalities and town halls, but also by city residents? Do they want to make sure that this kind of trans uh, transportation programs adopted by cities? What else can we do to involve uh, people living in our cities in discussing uh, things like healthy streets and how and in what way can we make urban environment in on cities and around the cities more attractive and of course what kind of uh, newer and modern technologies can be utilized to make sure that we increase um, mobility or active lifestyle of citizens to make sure that our city is more attractive for life and more livable for that matter and as a moderator so to speak, I would like very briefly to introduce some trends which we are discussing these days in Moscow to make sure that our guests have a better uh, idea and better perspective on what Moscow is about today in numbers. And also, we have analyzed uh, strategies of some uh, cities, quite successful cities in terms of implementing transportation programs such as um, London, such as uh, New York, uh, Singapore. And I would like uh, very briefly to give you update on what we have seen uh, from the officially uh, adopted strategies of uh, developing uh, for these cities. Hopefully my presentation is on screen right now. Next slide, please. What do we see here? Uh, on this slide. On the left, Moscow, uh, next, London, next, on to the right, Singapore, and uh, on the your right is New York. Uh, Mayor of Moscow said that the future uh, belongs not to countries but to cities, and we fully support uh, this uh, trend, which in Russia resulted in the fact that yesterday I heard that 70% of the Russian population already live in urbanized areas, which is very unusual unusual number for uh, the Russian Federation because initially you would think that due to um, developing big uh, territories, uh, many many Russians grew up in rural communities, in villages, in country in the countryside. But today, 70% of Russians are um, living in big cities, which is amazing. 55% of our population, if I'm speaking about the global geography um, in the world, they live in cities. And in the not-so-long future, up to 70% of uh, all the global population by the year 2050 will be living in cities. And of course, it um, poses certain challenges uh, to us as the city management responsible for um, transportation to make sure that we create comfortable living conditions, which will be, which will be comparable with those in the non-urban areas. What are the priorities? First of all, is ecology and safety, uh, health of um, the residents, uh, mobility and speed, and the level of satisfaction with the quality of services. And of course, the cornerstone of this is, I believe, is a transportation infrastructure because, to a large extent, the transport is an indicator of how, of how well the cities and their management. Um, tackle challenges they're facing today uh, because uh, things like transportation for many people in Moscow it's about 70% of uh, Muscovites every day use a uh, rapid transit system I'm speaking about the public transportation 30% of people in our city use private cars and uh, we are happy to know that percentage of people using uh, public uh, rapid transit little by little bit but it's growing every year Now, uh, very briefly, how the Moscow was evolving and what has been done to make sure that public transportation would be 
uh, used by a um, bigger number of people. You can see the pictures on the slide. This is what we've had back in 2010 and what has happened already in 2019. I'm speaking about the high priority of the above ground uh, transportation. We just begin to change infrastructure, change the rolling stock. And as of today, we do not have a single bus uh, on the roads, which would be older than 2011. We have updated 100% of our um, of our bus fleet. Uh, in two and a half years, we'll have the total totally new uh, trams. We've built about 75 metro stations in the time being. We have introduced single standards uh, for developing um, ground public transportation. We abandoned uh, those uh, transport companies who were working on their own rules. Now everybody is working using the single tariff system, single standards for the same you know, benefits, single benefits for those who are entitled to these benefits. We've made a big taxi reform. Uh, something to be proud about. And here we have Tigran from the Yandex Taxi online company. It's a company who, to a large extent, became, became the driver of the changes in the taxi industries in Moscow. And by the way, the government of Moscow does not own a single taxi company. It's all private business and something we take pride in. And of course, we've uh, systematized our ticketing system. Now you can use one single card for all transport, and the tariffs are reasonable. Yes, there is room for growth, but we have a very clear uh, development program. Today, the Troika uh, plastic uh, card is the most popular card in, in, in Europe. We've issued about 25 million such uh, transport cards. We have been heavily involved in the uh, in the traffic situation. I cannot say that we totally overcame the traffic congestion. Yes, we do have the uh, the hard traffic and traffic jams, but at least we try to do everything we can, uh, everything we we could do, uh, to reorganize uh, traffic, to manage traffic better, to make sure that these bottlenecks would be relieved and to have some um, some better traffic, better movement. Next would be would be working with uh, parking spaces in the city and also decreasing uh, traffic accidents. Since 2010 in Moscow, we've seen the fourfold uh, decrease in the mortalities and fatality cases related to traffic accidents. Moscow today is the safest uh, city in the Russian Federation, judging by the rate of the traffic incidences and accidents. And the challenge of the mayor of Moscow require us to to further increase the safety of the uh, of driving. As for the landscaping, greening, improving the streets, uh, all these streets in Moscow have been uh, improved. We've uh, delineated the traffic flows from the traffic of, uh, of pedestrians. We were able, were possible, and where there would be no conflicts to build the cycling infrastructure and also made uh, dedicated lanes for automatic tra um, transportation. Uh, we have the uh, bike rental systems. Um, uh, as for the number of rentals per bike, Moscow is among the leaders. So we, per every bicycle, we have seven rental companies, or uh, sorry, seven uses. On average, uh, on average, seven different people are using the same bike uh, in a day for different trips. Some people use it to simply for the pleasure ride. Some people to go to a metro station and to leave the bike and then to keep uh, going um, using other transit system. Another important aspect is um, moving on to the electric transportation. And uh, we have um, adopted the special uh, regulation by the Russian government to make sure that since uh, 2021, we fully give up uh, buying uh, diesel powered uh, buses. We are only going to buy electric buses. Today, we buy about 300 electric buses a year. And since 2021, their number will be increased uh, from 800 to 1,000 buses a year. Now um, there are 130 electric buses um, are being used in Moscow. And um, it also places Moscow among the European leaders by the number of uh, uh, public electrical transportation or vehicles on the roads. We can further uh, talk about different rating systems and where Moscow stands in these international ratings and how uh, different expert, um, uh, expert person would evaluate it. It's a rating by McKinsey made in the last year. 
And here the mask was placed number six against the biggest mega policies of the world. And probably you can you can have a different opinion of where, where Moscow stands in these ratings. But uh, definitely there are some cities where the quality of uh, public transportation is higher than in Moscow, like Paris, London, Hong Kong, Madrid. And, and uh, uh, we understand where to go and what to do. And uh, we have the very clear development strategy for public transportation. Next, I would like to move to these great examples experience of which we study every day. And here I would like to refer to the city of London. I would like to apologize for my colleagues who do not speak uh, Russian. Maybe it won't be very easy for them to read the slides, but I'm going to give you some numbers. Some of these numbers uh, surprised me, and I would like to share with you uh, these numbers. And hopefully we uh, will talk about them. We have um, our colleague, uh, Lucy Saunders from London. And she has been doing a lot for building the healthy street strategies uh, in the city of London. And this strategy, which has been published by the London mayor, it's a strategy 2040, that is until uh, 2040. In addition to developing uh, public transit, um, transport, increasing its capacity, the uh, goal was said that 80% of all uh, movements in the city has to be done by public transportation, uh, by bicycle, or on food. So the number of private cars would only account for 20% of this traffic. And interesting indicator, uh, which is quite a reason, reason in the London strategy development. It's a goal. And it sounds like that, that for every Londoner to walk on the streets at least 20 minutes a day. And this would be enough uh, to maintain health no, status. Here at this session, we also have a professional in medical field, and I also would like to discuss with him later, I mean, how important uh, for one to just be walking, just be moving along the streets, you know, how it impacts your health, and how does it impact um, the future generations, and um, the how does it impact the health of the city, and probably the when the city uh, promotes uh, pedestrian traffic, Probably the city is also saving some costs related to medical expenses and others. I would really like to discuss it and see how these trends um, really, really, really stick. But this 20 minutes a day where the city is saying, OK, we will um, try to make sure that the residents uh, would walk 20 minutes a day. We'll assist them in doing that, even by by running public transport, not as convenient as you would like to, it to be, so that you still have to walk from your house uh, to a bus or a tram station. So otherwise, it's a stimulation. Uh, maybe not a compulsory. Compulsory would be the bad word here, right? But at least uh, to stimulate you somehow to move more, to walk more. And this is quite an interesting issue. I'm also uh, hoping that, that uh, our colleague from London who would share, if I understand the strategy correctly in London, because I read it, I reread it recently just to make sure I understand the London strategy correctly. And also, also a couple of words about Singapore. It's a 2030 strategy. Our colleagues have been mentioning about this. It's an official program which has been adopted by the Singapore government where there is an provisions for increase of the public transportation use. 85% of uh, all uh, trips, which is the goal of Singapore, uh, to make sure 80% um, in 2030, 85% of all the uh, transit should be done by public transportation. And also the question is to, in, to organize the, tra the traffic, um, to have to have the 10-minute um, um, walking access to the nearest bus or tram stop for the 95% of residents. And they say that uh, also pedestrian movements is good. People have to walk more often. It will be supported and stimulated by the city. In addition to um, building and developing uh, infrastructure, um, uh, metro infrastructure, dedicated lanes and railways. And finally, New York. Mayor of, Mayor of New York built a strategy, uh, 2030, where there are several goals, and one of them is Vision Zero, that is uh, uh, zero fatalities um, at the public roads. And another goal is developing infrastructure, uh, decreasing uh, uh, gas emissions, GHG emissions, uh, and uh, by by 2020, increasing the cycling trips by twofold.
It's a special emphasis which we've seen in the transportation strategies of the major cities. It's a special emphasis on alternative movement, which will be alternative not only to a privately owned car, but even to the public transit. That is when person is relocating by walking, by cycling, by using the scooter and by simply walking from point A to point B. I'm really hoping that when my colleagues will be speaking, hopefully they'll mention about that, um, what this trend, trend means for them, which has been non-existent in transportation strategies before. Why do we have this trend in strategies? Is it important or not important? And how can we help Moscow to build a similar behavior? How to make such a preconditions that... Um, that moving on food uh, from your home, from door to bus stop or elsewhere would be comfortable and to make sure that uh, Muscovites would be uh, stimulated to walk more or to um, move more using alternative transportation. This, this is the scope of questions I would like to discuss. And the very first question, in addition to these things, I also would like to address my uh, transport colleague from the uh, city of Tallinn, which I have some relation to. It's Andrei Novikov, who is uh, responsible for public transportation in Tallinn. Andrei, in your uh, city, you were one of the first in Europe when you uh, introduced uh, free, uh, non-chargeable transit in public transportation, just to make sure that people use public transport more often. How do you see the development of these uh, free rides? Uh, were you able to attract more people using public transportation as they do not have to pay it? And uh, maybe it's some kind of devaluation when something is free. You know, it could be a psychological thing that if the bus or a tram is for free, it, it may not be perceived as valuable. Would you recommend the same approach for Moscow? Um, is it worthwhile even to consider this? Please go ahead. Uh, Thank you. Well, indeed. Public transport is free for all residents of the city of Tallinn. As for guests, they still have to pay because the city is funding public transport from city budget. We started sponsoring free travel for residents in 2013. This was in in part a social project to help people recover from global financial crisis of 2008. So that was, in a sense, a social project. But I can tell you that increase in ridership, well, we I wouldn't say we saw a great increase. No, we didn't. And since then, economy has grown and People always consider different alternatives. If it, if traveling from central part of city to city outskirts costs five euros, if you take by, if you go by taxi, and at the same time, if you can buy a good cheap car for three thousand and maintain it, would not be difficult or expensive. People always choose the private cars. It's like a choice between eating at home and eating out. But the trend is changing. We see new generation coming. It's especially pronounced in Scandinavia where people, people's mindset is changing. People move from ownership model where you had to own a car, an apartment, this was your number one priority. Once you graduate from college, you buy a car, then you buy an apartment. And these were important stages of people's lives. But now people start thinking differently. In Scandinavia, for instance, that's a very different trend present. There are fewer and fewer people that apply for car license. And the drop is dramatic. So the trend has reversed. And in the future, there'll be fewer car people that own private cars. It's the same we see. The number of people that trend is going up. And the trend of recent years has been that in public transport, 
on the average. Operation time is eight years, same as in Moscow, and we're also going to renew the pack. We see new people coming that think that public transport is the most convenient way to get from A to B. And the next two, three years, I think we will see more people using public transport. Now, Finnish colleagues did an interesting research. And they concluded that people that use private cars mostly change from private cars to rail transport. In Estonia, for instance, we've updated <laughs> commuter trains, and the number of people that use them increased dramatically. We've introduced new trams, and in the future, we're planning to stress the development network of trams, because that will give a push people to use this type of transport. We're also developing other types of transport. So for a bus to be convenient, you need to dedicate lanes, you need to assign dedicated lanes, you need to make sure it's clean, that it goes on time, according to schedule, that we install online systems on bus stops that shows you when your bus is going to come. There's more and more of them. On the other hand, we see that probably it's not going as fast as we would like it to, but we did it all we could. Do I understand correctly that once you made public transport free, it did not increase ridership dramatically? No, it didn't. Not dramatically, but for very, very many, it's convenient because you no longer have to think which zone it is, where I am, and people use public transport to travel a short distance. So we have more people that travel short distance than before. One more question I wanted to ask you. I said that since 2011, the average operation time for a bus is 4.7 years. We don't have old buses, but talking about electric buses. Tallinn is a city that prioritizes environment, high-tech solution. What do you think about electric buses? Are they on the agenda? Well, sooner or later, all cities of the world will switch to electronic buses unless a new technology is invented. But right. you know, later we'll shift from combustion engines to something more modern. It's for Tallinn. By the way, I want to say I admire you because from the point of view of environment, it's very important. I know you're producing, you're procuring locally produced electric buses. And that, on the one hand, protects the environment, and on the other hand, gives a push to the development of a local of local companies that produce this technology. And this takes you to the forefront. Others will learn from you. So, chapeau. As for us, we'll be operate, we were using more and more gas fueled buses. If we look at the number of kilometers buses travel every day, it's over 400 kilometers. As for electric buses, the maximum range is 240, so they're not our best solution. Either we'd need to think of extra charging stations, and that would require change in infrastructure, so we're going to wait either for a breakthrough or for the price to go down because Right now, electric buses are too expensive. I think the price will drop in the next two to three years, two or threefold, and then we'll switch to them, but not as fast. Right now, we don't think it's economically viable. 
Thank you. Just yesterday, Mayor of Moscow signed an agreement with Kamaz, and in 2021 or 2022, some of electric buses will be assembled in Moscow because they need a competence center here in Moscow and all the engineering solutions regarding battery or appearance. All of that will be done, all the R&D will be done in Moscow, which, by the way, will create a lot of high-tech jobs for Moscow. Over 3,500 people will work on this new platform. Huh? Next question to Tigran Kudeverdan, who is managing director in Yandex, is in charge of driverless cars and taxis. So a question, a few years back, taxis uh, were a highly criminal segment and now it's completely legal business, so over 800,000 trips by taxi take place in Moscow every day. How will taxis develop in future? Which services will attract Moscovites further? How can you encourage people to use taxis more? When will we have first driverless taxis? And what solutions can be promised to Moscovites that would make taxi trips uh, a more reasonable and easy choice? Thanks. You said that taxis, taxi business used to be dominated by criminals. I remember back in 2010 when we first contemplated the idea, Gandex, one of our colleagues, approached us and said, us, you know, in New York, taxi drivers have to wear special protection gear on their necks during the night because they're often robbed at night and uh, those criminals try to suffocate taxi drivers. Therefore, they have to wear, so therefore they have to wear the protection collar on their necks. So most taxi trips in Moscow and globally are now paid by pay cashlessly through apps, and that helps deal with criminal problems. As the challenges, well, the major challenge is that gradually uh, Uber, Yandex Taxi, and other major players will focus more and more on safety. We're done with cash problem, but still there are very many car accidents. Mortality rate on roads remains very high. And it's especially important when we talk about taxis because we trust drivers we don't even know. We trust our children to drivers we don't even know. We need to make sure it's safe. We did a little experiment some a solution we integrated about six months ago in all countries where we operate. So we started controlling our driver's speed. And if we see that they violate speed limit regimes, we send him notifications at the end of the day saying, look, you violated traffic regimes this number of times. Unless you stop, we're going to block you. And then miracle happened. The number of violations dropped 12-fold. Our drivers really started to be more cautious. We haven't yet collected statistics on how that impacted number of road accidents. But the very fact that we see that drivers listen to our comments, we had to block about one and a half percent of drivers that refused to cooperate. So this is one big change that happened. Now we're discussing with Moscow authorities, maybe putting special marks on those parts of the streets where there's high danger over their schools and warn drivers that, for instance, you're approaching 
an area where there are likely to be kids on road, etc. So it's just a simple, a small example, one of many challenges we're facing now. All car sharing companies in the world will become more and more active in the field. because they are becoming an important component of public transport. And they can and should deal with safety as well. Talking about future, we have a lot of confidence in a mix of different types of transport. None of us uses one transport during the day. We all use different types of transport. We have our own private cars, we use taxis, car sharing, subway, we walk, and what our goal is, is to help people build routes, understand which one would be optimal at this point in time, because sometimes the fastest way would be to take a taxi and a different hour, subway will be the best solution. And it would be saving time for people. In the future, people will be able to upload an app, pay a little money, and then see what the best option is and take different types of transport. You, someone mentioned walking by foot. For instance, uh, this could be an option, your app. You could indicate, I need to walk at least 10 minutes a day, so please build my routes accordingly. Thank you, Tigran. We have with us Kent Larson, who works on development of cities. He knows all problems that cities encounter in their development. He helps city authorities build efficient transport systems can tell us, what would you recommend generally to colleagues that are present here? And maybe there's something specific you'd recommend Moscow based on what you saw while being here in Moscow. Well, last, last night, as I mentioned, um, we were um, stuck in traffic. A trip that was 10 minutes was about 40. And this is common in many of the big cities. And I think I think the challenge we were talking about just before the session uh, is in part to put the available jobs in harmony with the available housing. Uh, in, so I learned from the vice mayor that 30% of the jobs in all of Moscow are in the central city, but there's only 7% of the housing available in the central city. I think that is correct, is it not? which means that one would have to increase by more than a factor of four the housing in the central city to create integrated walkable communities. Uh, and then there are all kinds of new mobility modes that one can introduce. I see my slides are here. Can I go through a few slides? Yeah. Okay. So this is, if it was playing, looks like there Barcelona, 1908. This is the very beginning of the first mobility revolution. This is when trams were entering the city, where communities were high density and compact. And um, I'm sorry, this was supposed to play farther into it. Well, if we don't get into the, the images, that's fine. Here we go. Here's the tram going through the city. And you see, streets were fundamentally for people. There are a few cars that rich people had, but it's mostly filled with pedestrians and bicycles. There are no traffic lights, there are no, there are no crosswalks, jaywalking was not illegal. Uh, and uh, people lived near where they worked. There were, there were shops and uh, cultural amenities available within a 10 minute walk. This is what we're looking at now for uh, the mobility modes that we would like to see in a central city. So the most important by far is in the upper right-hand corner, which is walking. 
Bikes are the second most important. All kinds of micro-mobility now are entering the city. The ones in the red boxes are the mobility modes that we are working on. Uh, and all in a compact, walkable di district is what uh, we're trying to uh, model. And if we look at now um, a brief history of our work related to mobility, this is the city car that we did about 10 years ago. It, uh, it's looking at what would be the ideal car for the city. In this case, two persons. Most trips are either one or two people. It uses very little land. It folds, so the length of the car is the width of the conventional car. Step directly out on the curb. Triples the parking that's available. Now, we like to build things at MIT. We build a full-scale prototype and tested this. It has a yoke that pivots left and right. You can drive it in Paris and London at the same time. When we finished that project, though, we said, we don't want to do conventional cars. The future is autonomous vehicles, and they are, in effect, social robots. So this is looking at ways that a car can communicate more naturally with a human when there's no driver to signal its intention. And the future, I believe, is bringing together autonomy with sharing plus, plus ultralight electric vehicles. Uh, and we decided to focus on driving in bike lanes. And to that end, we created what we call the persuasive electric vehicle. It persuades you to get more physical exercise and persuades you to uh, adopt more sustainable mobility modes. It's something between shared bikes and rideshare like Uber and Lyft. This is something what the vehicle looked like. You call for it, it comes to you wherever you are autonomously. You can drive it to your destination. I believe the great advantage of autonomy is automated pickup and drop off, more, even more so than autonomous operation when a human is in it. And, and you can see here, these are two young women in a, in a bike lane. The one doesn't even look up from her phone, and the other has a smile on her face. So you see, it's, these vehicles, I think, in the future will interact more naturally with people. We've tested these vehicles around the world. We're looking at commercializing them. We just finished a next-generation vehicle in Japan. Quite complex technology. The challenge is not building an autonomous vehicle. Everybody does that now and they'll become commodities. The challenge, I think, is to bring the cost down so it can be in much lighter weight uh, mobility modes. We're, we're also working on an autonomous bicycle to address the challenge of these stationless bikes that end up in graveyards like this. This is in Hangzhou, China. Get rid of the bike stations and the redistribution. So this is a, this is a little bicycle that you drive like you would any bike but it converts to a three-wheel vehicle that's fully autonomous so it can come to you like the other vehicle and rebalance itself automatically. Uh, and uh, so we're building a full-scale prototype of that right now. This is a hint at what I think the third mobility revolution is. The first was tram subways, the second were cars that took over our city, and the third is to reclaim the streets by people. If you look closely, this is almost exactly like you saw in Barcelona. The trams are going through, people step out of the way, it's filled with pedestrians, even children, bicycles, the cars move very slowly, it's shared space. So this is, I think, a little hint of the future. It's recapturing streets for people from the last hundred years where we've designed streets for machines. So that maybe is a little, little window into what we're working on. So tell me if that answered your question. Uh, uh, Ken, could you please say, in your view, the number of cars which people will own and the people will own these cars, a number of cars uh, which they'll be renting, uh, using as uh, autonomous vehicles. What will be correlation, the breakdown between the first and the second, let's say in the next 10 or 20 years? Just to what extent people will still try to own their vehicle or the ownership will become um, unnecessary? It will be enough only to get any kind of transportation which will come to you autonomously. What are the trends? What is your perspective? I think it's generational. See, when I grew up, I. I wanted a car because that was freedom and uh, status. 
and I got a car when I turned 16. But the young people today, I'm finding, particularly the ones I deal with, none of them want to own a car. They say, why would I own a car if I can ride a bike, use the subway, call an Uber on a weekend, use um, Zipcar to get whatever vehicle I want. I don't want have to deal with insurance and parking. So I think if you're looking even 10 years out, it will become um, increasingly unlikely that young people will want to own a car because we'll have this proliferation of all these other, of all these other modes. And, and mobility will, transition's already happening, all the car companies say, that they want to transition from being a commodity manufacturer to a service company. So we're moving from making vehicles for sale to mobility on demand or mobility as a service. I think in 20 years we'll look back to cities filled with 4,000 pound private automobiles with one person in that going 10 kilometers per hour through Moscow as sheer insanity. I think will people 20 years in the future will say, what were they thinking? Well, uh, thank you. I, I totally share your uh, per point of view, your perspective of how things are going to evolve and develop in terms of ownership of cars. I wanted to show you just one slide. Uh, hopefully my colleagues will help me. Just to uh, confirm on what you're saying, that in Moscow, in Moscow, car sharing or the short-term car lease, it first appeared about three years ago, a little bit less than three years ago, and it had been non-existent in Moscow before. But today, Moscow is the second place in the world by the uh, number of car-sharing cars. Uh, only Tokyo has more car-sharing vehicles. But we're thinking by the end of 2019, we'll have about 25,000 uh, cars dedicated for car sharing, which will be available for the short-term lease. In Tokyo, they have 20,000 cars, which tells us that even even when there was no tradition to use personal vehicle uh, for the short-term lease, the trend, uh, the trend accommodated itself so quickly in Moscow, and the pace of development is so fast. People are basically willing not to buy a car, but to use, um, I mean, to rent a car, not to own a car, because, again, ownership means problems. And I guess uh, Moscow's example and the strategy and the vision that you've mentioned about is already in place. Next question, I would like to ask uh, Lucy Saunders. Uh, Lucy has been working a lot with the uh, London uh, administration and her ideas and her concepts of healthy streets, healthy streets have become the foundation of not only you know, for those people who are developing cities, but it has become the basis of transport strategy of London. And therefore, I uh, would kindly ask uh, Lucy to share with us uh, what prompted you to engage in this field? What are the trends uh, from your point of view? And just to what extent this kind of uh, project like Healthy Street could be could be utilized in big cities? And uh, are these ideas uh, shared by transportation authorities and, and mayor of London, for example? And uh, what kind of uh, support uh, of Londoners for these kind of projects and many others? Lucy, the floor is yours. So I've got a few slides to take you through to talk about the experiences in London. This picture at the beginning is one of the suburban areas of London and this is a really key part of healthy streets. It's not just about making the city centre look nice, it's about making sure that people who live in suburban areas have alternative options than using a car for all their journeys. So here you see a woman cycling on a cycle track in a neighbourhood and that used to be uh, the road but they took the space away from the cars. Still, many journeys have to happen in the suburbs by car, but there's the alternative of cycling. And the way they made this um, popular with the local residents was they didn't just build cycle tracks in the same way that we build highway for cars. They made the street feel like a really lovely place to spend time as well. So you see there's a lot of planting on this street, which is new, and this was put here so that the local people would be supportive of taking space away from cars and creating more space for walking and cycling. So if we move on, I'm going to take you through the background to all of this. So my next slide. Um, 
Do I need to use the clicker? Cool. Thanks. This slide here shows a very depressing story, which is why it's a boring gray slide. It's the top causes of illness and early death in the World Health Organization's European region, which includes Russia. And so these top causes, for those of you who um, can't read them, are high blood pressure, poor diet, then smoking, alcohol and drug use, overweight and obesity, high cholesterol, diabetes, air pollution, occupational risks, kidney disease, malnutrition, and low physical activity. So these are the top issues that are the concern of public health professionals. How do we address these? And for me as a public health professional, I want to have the biggest possible impact on improving people's health. So if I show you this graph again, this is the same graph, but it shows you in color all the elements of, this, of these top causes that I can improve by changing the way the streets look and feel, by changing the transport system. So the green bars on this graph, these all relate to how physically active we are if we take exercise every day, walking and cycling. There's a small red section for road traffic injuries, and there is a blue section for air pollution. So for a public health professional, the best thing that I can spend my time doing is changing the street environments, because this will deliver the best benefit for people. The top causes of transport on human health are the same in cities around the world. They are lack of physical activity, when we sit in cars for hours every day when we could be taking exercise, injuries from road traffic collisions, breathing in poor air quality, exposure to noise pollution, and something we call severance, which is when it's difficult to get from where you are to where you want to be. And all of these five main health impacts all relate to how we choose to manage motorized road transport. And it is a choice of governments as to how we choose to manage motorized road transport. And these choices that we make in terms of policy have big health impacts. So I took these five main health impacts and I turned them into a framework. You may not be surprised to hear that there are a lot of people who don't like looking at really depressing graphs that tell them about death and illness. It's not a good way to make friends. So I don't show this graph normally to people. Instead, what I do is I show them the 10 healthy streets indicators. I shouldn't be flicking around now, I've broken the system. If we move on to the next one. Oh, so these 10 healthy streets indicators, this is a positive framework. This is about how we can make streets good places for people. And this is a framework that doesn't really talk about health and it doesn't really talk about disease. It talks about a vision for a city that is a better place for the people who are in that city. And it makes it a much more powerful framework to bring together all the different stakeholders who need to work together to deliver better streets for people. So you see it's not written in a technical language, it's written in plain language. And this Healthy Streets framework, these 10 Healthy Streets indicators, they don't just drive all the decision making in the transport sector. So here you see the Mayor of London's transport strategy is included. This is the 25 year plan for the transport system and it's all based on healthy streets but also the spatial plan for the city. So deciding what gets built where and how, this is also framed around healthy streets. So you can't build in London a new development that has lots of car parking, that doesn't have cycle parking. These are things that would not be good for the city, so you cannot build these developments anymore in London. It's important that healthy streets is in this spatial plan. But also you can see all the other parts of government that work together to deliver this same vision for the city, healthy streets. An important part of this is that the strategy is not just a document that says some nice things, it has actually been turned into reality in terms of what people do in their job every day. 
So the strategy is a 25-year plan for delivering healthy streets. And you heard earlier the top-line targets for this strategy are 80% of journeys on foot, cycle and public transport, and for everyone to be able to walk or cycle for 20 minutes a day. But this 25-year vision and plan is broken down into a fully funded five-year business plan. So there is money committed to spend £2.3 billion over the next five years in London to deliver the first five years of this 25-year strategy. So we are very clearly putting our monies where our mouth is and doing the things that we said we would do in our plan. But maybe most importantly is something called the scorecard. So the scorecard is what drives performance within the Transport Authority each year. And the bosses in the Transport Authority, they get given a bonus at the end of the year if they hit their targets. So they are very, very interested in making sure that they hit their targets because they get some money for it. And in this scorecard, we have a measure of how healthy the streets are. I'm going to show you how it works. So this is, the, this is how the scorecard works. Every single project that is proposed for the city has to have a check done on it against the 10 indicators. And the, the existing street environment is scored and then the proposal is scored. So here is one real example in London that has now been built. You can see the picture at the top shows what the street looked like before. And the blue line in the circle shows you how it's scored against the healthy streets indicators. And the picture at the bottom shows you what the street looks like now. And the red circle shows you how much better, how much healthier the street that was proposed was than the existing conditions. And because it showed this good level of improvement, this project went forward and was built. Other projects that don't show good improvements to make the street healthier, they don't get funding. So this is how the 25-year strategy translates all the way down to every single decision every day in the Transport Authority to make sure that the street is a healthier street. And uh, Maxim mentioned uh, the important question, which is, could healthy streets be applied in another city or is it just for London? Well, I developed healthy streets not for London specifically. I developed this to apply to any town or any city anywhere in the world. These 10 healthy streets indicators are what people need, and people have the same needs in terms of their health everywhere. So this framework does work in other places, and now I work with other cities and towns around the world who are taking this same healthy streets approach. Thank you. Lucia, thanks a lot for this presentation and for uh, explaining so clearly the principle of the program. But still, I wanted to ask you, just um, to what extent this kind of pro implementation of these programs, just how big is your support and your support of the Londoners, of the residents in these issues? Because even that photo that you've shown us, uh, there is a dramatic change, right? There is a drastic change of the number of lanes for private cars. Uh, you have more space. You give more space for pedestrians. Uh, those people who live in there, do they really support it? Are, are they happy about this initiative or not? Thank you. Yes, it's a very important part of Healthy Streets is the, the success comes from the fact that it is popular with people because many people feel when transport policy is changed that they are being told by government that something they love is being taken away from them. So they are told, we're going to take away the opportunity for you to drive, and that doesn't feel good. But if you instead frame what you're doing in terms of we're going to give you something, people are much more supportive of this approach. And Healthy Streets goes to people and says, how healthy do you find your street right now? And they will say, it feels dangerous, it feels noisy, it's difficult for me to cross, uh, I don't feel comfortable and relaxed. And so then they say, well, let's talk together about how we can improve these things. And together with the community, they feel like they are making the proposals for the changes. They realize themselves that the problem is the traffic dominance. And the only way they will have a better environment to live in is if they are willing to change the street so that it's a more pleasant, relaxing place, which is better for walking and for cycling. 
The reason why the Mayor of London took this approach and was willing to fully endorse it was because he's a directly elected mayor by nine million people and he does what he knows will be popular with the people and he knew that this framework would be a, a popular framework to take to ensure that uh, the residents are supportive of him. Lucia, once again, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, the information that you've delivered, it really deserves to be uh, looked into, to be uh, used more proactively by different cities. I wanted to ask a question to Alexei. Alexei uh, Utin, he's not a transport specialist, but he's a professional doctor. And uh, he knows deeper all the processes related to uh, healthy lifestyles. And I wanted to ask the following question for Alexei. These 20 minutes of... Uh, of active movement every day, uh, walking, cycling, jogging, you know. How, how is it important for us? And can you give us some just very clear down-to-earth examples why we need uh, to walk or run or jog every day so that maybe our audience uh, here or those who will be uh, listening to us in later would make some conclusions for themselves and possibly change their lifestyle? Because what Lucy has just mentioned, um, to stimulate or to even make people somehow to walk more, to cancel, I don't know, some of the bus stops uh, to uh, to say like Tigran. Okay, if people be ordering taxi, the taxi should not arrive right here. This is not the right approach uh, which is expected of uh, city authorities. How can we convince people of the need to move more? Yes, thank you. I thank you for the question. And. I'm not a doctor here. I'm also the blogger. I have a blog about a healthy lifestyle. I'm trying to teach people how and why we need to do that. And as a doctor, very often I'm uh, I'm trying to come up with a certain strategy for, of modifying the uh, lifestyle of my patients. I realize that all these recommendations, you know, I have to do this physical activity. There is a big... A lot of information, when you give people a lot of information, if the person is buying a fitness club uh, pass and say, okay, next Monday I'm starting to do fitness. Sometimes people do not go to these fitness clubs for months. There's interesting research. It tells that if you buy uh, a treadmill, a treadmill into your house, 75% of people use it uh, as a very expensive uh, hanger for to dry their clothing, you know. They do not even use it for jogging, for running. And the best recommendation I can give about, about modifying lifestyle is built-in physical activity into your daily life. I mean, walk to your j uh, workplace, um, walk back home, build it, you know. Um, uh, skip one metro station and um, go earlier, go back to your place uh, three and a half kilometers and just walk it seven kilometers a day, just walk it, you know, skip your public transportation, don't use elevators, just use the stairs in every time it's possible. Now I wanted to say a few words about how human body functions. Why is it we need physical activity? If I were to ask you, you'd probably say, well, I need to be active to be healthy. But there is this molecule in your body. Young Fleming wrote about Dr. No, was a bad hero. We look at nitro-oxygen, and it's a very positive molecule that your blood that endothelium develops as your blood goes through your veins. There's a tension that the blood produces at, as it goes through your vascular system. And this molecule reduces the amount of cholesterol and blood in, uh, and sugar in your blood and thus eliminates problems that result in heart strokes and it regulates your immune system so it's very positive so this nitrogen oxide is developed by endothelium that and this is a large organ in your body endothelium and it produces this oxygen nitrate oxygen 
But if you don't move, this endothelium doesn't work. And not enough Not enough nitrogen oxide is produced. And this results in higher blood pressure, cholesterol, sugar levels in blood, there's higher risks of inflammation, thrombosis, because we lack physical activity. And nitrogen oxide, you cannot accumulate it. Like when you're at a wedding, you can't eat for the future. You can't accumulate food in your body. Same with nitrogen oxide, you cannot accumulate it. And there is research that shows if you sit without motion in front of a computer or a TV for eight hours, it cannot be compensated because there's physiological change happening in your body. That's why you need to move, you need to be in constant movement, you know, to the office, from your office. Maybe take little walks during lunch around dinner table. So the sedentary lifestyle uh, reduces your life expectancy up to seven years of it. If smoking reduces your life expectancy by 10 years, this reduces it from two to seven years in sedentary lifestyle. So what, what can be done? Walking will help. Nordic walk is also an option, although it's still alien for Russia. Then there are scooters and bikes. I don't know if I approve electric scooters and electric bikes, because they're cheating in a way. But yeah, should use every occasion to Walk, walk the 10,000 steps. 15,000, by the way, is even better. And then twice or three times a week, you should work out. Not every day, but two or three times a week, like an interval training where you vary intensity of training. So this is how, and I can talk like that for hours on end. Well, tell, tell us how ask you bluntly. We all care about our city, about city dwellers, we want to help them. And you as doctor, you're interested in seeing more healthy people around. So, so when drafting a transportation strategy, the cities, do you think we need to take conscious steps that would result in making people walk more, inducing them to walk more? Should it be free choice of people? Uh, you remember in Singapore, their goal is by the year 2030, to make sure that people walk 80% of People that live in Singapore should walk to the nearest transport stop, uh, 800 meters max. And so we're well, trying to make our transportation system as comfortable as possible, but that reduces their levels of physical activity. So how do we find balance between comfort and active lifestyle? Well, people are lazy by nature, so we need to encourage them, but also we need not forget that there are persons with disabilities, people that cannot walk long distances. So we need to have that in mind. Elderly people, what if we find targeted solutions for different groups? If we were able to find separate solutions for persons with disabilities, yes, we should stimulate people to walk more. Okay, so if it takes you too long to walk to the nearest public transport stop, you should know that was intentional. We're taking care of you. We want you to walk more. So with this, I want to adjourn this session and thank the speakers.